Our next speaker, it would be Dr. N.K. Ganesh Prasad, and he would be speaking on how to tackle problems in nephrology. A small introduction about our speaker. He uh, completed his MBBS from Karnataka University in 1989, in DNB Internal Medicine uh, in 1996, and MNA, MNAMS Nephrology from uh, National Board of Exams in 2006, DNB Nephrology from National Board of Exams in uh, 2002, and he is presently the Senior Consultant of Nephrology at Miot Hospitals, Chennai. He's got many publications to its credit. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Pan and Don. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir, You're you audible. are, sir. And respectful sure salutations sir. to all the senior members of the IMA Kodambakam. And I was, I'm one of the elected members of this particular place where I'm talking to dions of uh, medicine, medical field. I had shared uh, one of the uh, dias with Dr. Shiva Kadaksham in one, one of the uh, talk somewhere else. And I was very happy to interact with him today indirectly, virtually, after a long, long time. I think that was in Andaman, if you, if you remember. Uh, so I am just here to not to teach anything in nephrology because you're all already dions. So I am just trying to... Uh, put in perspective that probably in uh, your practice, uh, if you come across certain patients of what I'm just going to talk about, uh, uh, how will you go about it? And of course, this is basically a common mistake that as a general practitioner, sometimes we keep doing it. I just want to highlight that we should not do that. Think about uh, the practice of uh, uh, nephrology in general practice. It's basically to kindle your uh, thing, nothing like one plus one, two, one, so that you can practice easily. So obviously it is not going to give an answer for you at all in any of your day-to-day uh, -day practice, but I just want you to keep alive or uh, rather thinking about uh, what will likely to be the pro uh, problems in nephrology. Having said, I have just moved on to Fortis after 16 years in Miot uh, for the last three months. And I'm just going to give you a small uh, overview of nephrology in general practice. My fear is the slide is seen. Slide is seen. So no, sir, not seen. yet. Please, not yet. Please share your screen. Now? Yes, sir. Your PPT is seen. If you'd be yeah. good, if you can go yeah. to... Yes, sir. Perfect, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening once again. If you go to the uh, hist history of what is happening over the long, long years, of changes in the medical field, 1900 to 1950. We're looking at infectious disease as the main problem. And 1950 to 2000, it was episodic uh, care. That is what was like cholera, typhoid, uh, other infectious disease that was coming into problems those days. And from 2000 to 2550, it was thought to be chronic care, like rheumatoid arthritis, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, etc. In 2006, WHO was thinking up to how to tackle this chronic problem, but then came uh, a new problem that is coronavirus, where we started to have probably we're going to have not just a combination of uh, infection alone, it is going to be a combination of infection with chronicity to be tackled from years now. And it is going to be a huge responsibility of, uh, uh, of the faculty, the medical faculty to uh, tackle this particular problem. If you look at the present scenario of healthcare, this particular uh, slide gives you exactly what we are going through. There's going to be a huge home-based self-management. And it's going to be a little, little about assisted home-based self-management. And this particular complete area is going to be managed by general practitioners. And only a small area of what's called hospital-based practice, really like interventions for cardiac or, or for the other uh, uh, renal, et cetera, are going to be a very small, small hospital-based practice is going to be there. But a huge chunk is going to be a home-based or assisted home care management. And there, there lies the tomorrow's problems and we, we need to tackle this in full strength. So when we refer the case to a nephrologist, we have to have some clear guidelines to provide a coordinated management for its complication. And if the patient needs transplant and dialysis, which you have probably thought of, it should be in a proper uh, guided way. Supposing we, uh, as of now, the 2020, we have only 2,600 nephrologists throughout the country. And it's going to be immense problem of uh, managing all the problems in nephrology by this, with this chunk of 2,600 nephrologists who are scattered in a different, different uh, uh, areas and a different uh, numbers. 
uh, uh, northeastern hardly have any nephrologist in the country, while certain parts of the rural areas still don't have any accessibility to nephrology, while other urban areas, there's quite a few nephrologists for the care. So we need to really have a, a general practitioner to significantly get guided by what, when to, uh, when to uh, refer the case to them. So this comes uh, not just for the personal care, it is about, comes about the whole holistic patient's care. You have to make sure that they don't stay for a longer time uh, in the hospital. They significantly get better much earlier if you properly send them for proper management. I'll just start with the case. The case and that presentation might sometimes be disconnect. I'll just try to uh, put into your case a 17-year-old boy, a second of the uh, two born of non consanguineous union with no family history of any hereditary family illness, presented uh, with a history of fever, uh, high-colored high urine of blood tinged uh, state and he also had no gravel urea no sore throat no arthralgia prior to this and of course the doctor who first saw him had, uh, did not really mention about the frequency dysuria terminal pain if he had while passing uh, urine with blood and the boy had no vices and no habits this is very important of present times and he had no history he gave history of some uh, red spots in the lower limbs one minute red spots in the lower limbs uh, about two to three weeks back, uh, and then he had uh, contacted some local practitioners who had given him some medicines for a week, and the rash disappeared. His blood pressure was somehow recorded was 145 and 90 by the practitioners. He had not noticed any uh, significant uh, systemic examination or any general physical examination was totally unremarkable. So he was found to have plenty of RBCs. The first thing he had to send the urine for examination found plenty of RBCs are expected, and also WBCs. So the usually the W this is mentioned sometimes as pus cells in the urine and the two plus albumin. He went on to do a, ultra, a urine culture which of course grew staphylococcus epidermidis and uh, this was enough for the practitioners to start him on quinolones as per the guidelines. Sorry for the spelling there. And of course the serum creatinine was also concurrently done. It was 1.5 milligram percent. A CB was, CBC was otherwise unremarkable. His ultrasound was showing marginally enlarged kidneys and rest were normal. So the practitioners thought, okay, I'm in treatment for a boy of 19, 17 years old, probably a UTI. Was it correct to think about UTI in this particular case? We need to just know about the urinary analysis a little more further. The red blood cells, the white cells, the mucus, various epithelial cells, various crystals, bacteria, and gas are usually seen in, this, in a urinary specimen. And each lab doesn't mention whether they are running the urine for a, a centrifugation or if it is uncentrifugal sample that has been submitted for microscopy. Because both centrifuge and uncentrifuge sample has got a different numbers for its importance. For example, an uncentrifuge sample showing even three to five can be uh, RBCs in the urine can be taken as significant. Or even a centrifuge sample of one RBC in urine can be taken as significant. We sometimes give uh, uh, credence to other things like hyphae, uh, fungal hyphae in the urine, yeast, parasites, viral inclusions, etc. And for pertinent cases, especially if it's going to be a transplanted individual. Otherwise, generally, we just don't try, we try to ignore all this, all these things in the urine. What is urine cast? Urine cast is nothing but the particles that has been uh, confined into the damp phosphorus mucoprotein. That is nothing but a scaffolding that gives, gives the, cast, the urine the cast in, into it. And the, cell, uh, the cast is once again divided into cellular and acellular cast. Acellular cast, that means there's no cells into it. It can be a highland cast, a granular cast, or the vaccine cast. Each one has got its own importance. I'm not going to go through the whole, whole talk on only urine, saying that is a uro, urinary conference, but I just want to highlight about few things that we need to give some importance in general practice. By cellular cast, of that, nothing but RBC cast that has been loaded into this time house for protein, which gives us a scaffolding, and that is seen as the RBC cast, which is very important in, in cases like uh, this, what I'm just talking about. So RBCs in urine has to mean things. One, whether it is just in number or whether it's got an additional features. Additional features, I mean, whether it is casted or whether it has got a morphology has been changed. Usually a blood in the urine is thought to be due to a glomerular disease, tumor, urinary tract stones, upper or low tract urinary infection. I put that as a last perspective in this particular talk. Collecting urine, of course, is itself is a separate chapter. You need to talk uh, collection of urine specific to that particular condition. Of course, having come for the random specimen, you need to know why far you're asking for the random specimen. If you're asking for a morning sample, usually it is for a pregnancy test by a gynecologist. And of course, if you're looking for the quantity of protein 
the overnight stasis of the purine also in the also in the bladder is going to mean something for the urinary estimation of proteins in in that particular sample so you should know what sample has been given for urinary examination and not just go uh, anecdotal to this to see a urinary sample report and then go ahead with the treatment so we need to really go into the history significant bacteriuria i am just rushing in few things on this particular case uh, means that 100000 or more colony, more uh, colony stimulating colony factors can be in per ml of urine is supposed to be significant there supposed to be a cas criteria which says that even 10 to the power of 2 with organisms particularly if there is a pyuria wbc is more than 10 per, uh, per meter square can be uh, thought to be a urinary tract infection especially if there is a symptoms and icds criteria has showed, uh, told that 10 to the power of 3 per ml of is enough to diagnose cystitis and 10 to the power of 4 per ml is enough to diagnose pyelonephritis of course we have other urinary uh, parameters to say what the patient is probably suffering i just wanted to have an highlight on this particular aroma that has been given a fractional fractional excretion of sodium which we use at the bedside as less than one and more than one to depict whether the patient has got probably a renal injury or non renal injury and of course the urinary sediments we talk it bland if there is no protein or no cells it is just as as simple as a normal urine but then the patient has still got some problems if it has got some cast or uh, either in cellular cast or rbcs we try try to say it as active urinary sediment so there are some things that can deceive the urinary samples too in general practice we should be aware that the drugs taken sometimes can give rise to a altered urinary picture for example sulfonamides can give its Uh, negate the presence of sugars or neg or negate or reduce the amount of proteinuria in it which are commonly used in general practice like sulfonuria like trimethoprim part of sulf uh, sulfonuria I mean, especially sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim combination can alter the urinary picture sometimes furosemide or diuretic which is also been used commonly by uh, practitioners or cardiologists can also alter the picture of the urine because it can cause interstitial injury and they can have leukocyteuria same is that of the nsaids some of the supplements if they have been given for the patient can also lead to changes in the urinary uh, picture some some of the diseases can not be usually picked up easily in the general practice but i think i think in the back of my mind we should think about myelomas can still have no protein in the urine especially if they are being done with the dipstick uh, dipstick method and they can miss the myeloma in that particular patient a, pa a patient likely to be elderly can come with the aches and pains and anemia and you might miss and you might still feel some urinary urinary symptoms might be there you might symptom you might miss some multiple myeloma in that particular case gouty arthritis sometimes sometimes be seen if you give your uh, attention to the crystals that is there in the urine which we likely to forego if it is not coming from a good lab so lab also has as a got to a got to say about the presence of problems in the patient commonly used drug that is aminoglycosides itself can give rise to changes in the urinary sample i was talking about the fractional excretion of sodium when the aminoglycoside toxicity happens the ironically the fractional excretion of the sodium doesn't go high doesn't go normal i mean doesn't go too high it may still remain normal this might even tell you that false uh, picture that you that you are not injuring the kidney because of aminoglycoside so you may not even use this fina what is called as fractional excretion of sodium at the bedside as a as a marker of a urinary or uh, a kidney injury same goes with the contrast in, uh, induced nephropathy which i think the contrast can be coming from an interventional radiologist as dr murli was just speaking which can also fool us sometimes the, there can be a low fina but the patient might still have a contrast injury in the kidney and this can also happen with the cardiologist perspective also the contrast they use in coronary artery disease can have low fina and it gives a false sense of security that the patient does may not have uh, a renal injury because of contrast so he might go happy happy go lucky patient other thing is about a huge thing about albuminuria i am just going to uh, concentrate on two things in this particular slide that is the proteins grams that amount of grams that is excreted in the urine and the sediments when we talk about glomerular nephritis we look into the rbcs in the urine the cast in the urine and uh, while we talk about so called interstitial nephritis we don't see any cast in the urine or any particular cells it's usually leukocyteuria in this particular cases of interstitial injury like it could be a contrast injury which could be aminoglycoside toxicity etc but a glomerular injury by and large will have numerous rbcs and they usually crenated what is called as dysmorphic rbcs this should herald you that the patient has some serious illness and you can't just give away as rbcs of some unknown cause patient also has got a significant what is called as nephrotic proteinuria in most of the glomerular nephritis that we tackle in the in the practice nephrology practice 
What are the caveats of uh, even this albumin urea? In, uh, in UK, they used to say no shot, no school. That means no vaccination, they don't, don't take into the school. There also was one period when they said no urinary analysis, they won't take into the school. That, that was the best time to catch the, catch the children in if they have any urinary abnormality. But even having said that, albumin can also have some variability uh, in normal normal person, especially if the, uh, it turns out to be a woman during a menstrual cycle, a symptomatic UTI, after ex uh, exercise. And if the change of posture, what we call as orthostatic proteinuria, a person working for a long time, long time standing, especially a factory worker, can have a tubular proteinuria, what is about 1.5 to 1, 1 gram of proteinuria in a day. So you can still uh, not blame them for their particular albumin in urine, saying that it is pathological. Sometimes in some of the genetic diseases, you can have some proteinuria, which you need to analyze very intricaciously. I was working in Fiji for some time, where the muscle mass of the Fijians, the Itokis, the basically around 140 to 170 kilos, 240 kilos per uh, the body weight goes with that and the muscle mass in them will definitely generate a lot of proteins in the urine and that might be a caveat for you to analyze that particular specimen in a lab like in india of course the race is also important age of the child is also the age of the person also is important when you take into consideration your uh, urinary albumin so there are some caveats so you should be minimally aware of these caveats i'm just going to highlight about this particular terminology what is called as microalbuminuria which is of course by the kdoc is one of the quality guidelines for the nephrologist has taken away this particular terminology usually anything like below 256 milligrams percentage or around the 256 milligrams percentage you call it as microalbumin just to herald that patient is likely to get a nephropathy possibly a diabetic etiology but this particular thing has no meaning today because we are going to uh, compare this albuminuria with that of the urinary creatinine, and this is not much of a stand. So we generally use this normal or decreased album, albumin in urine or moderate albumin in urine or severely increased albuminuria in that particular person. So there are some caveats, as I said, myeloma, they don't have a depiction in the dipstick, normal dipsticks. They can come as negative or there's one plus albumin in the urine, but sometimes you might miss Ben John's protein unless until you have a clinical acumen uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, myeloma in your differential diagnosis of the particular individual. So there are amount of albumin that can be uh, uh, calculated just by looking at the number of the albumin that have been told. One plus albumin says about the less than 30 milligrams per 24 hours. Uh, two plus albumin probably has three, 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hours. Or A, A3 or A3 plus albumin says that possibly the patient has more than 300 milligrams of albumin in 24 hours. So this is what we need to know rather than going into microalbumin levels, uh, which is asked even by endocrinologists at times uh, for a depiction of or diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy. There has been awareness screening of uh, knowing, uh, trying to know the CKD. CKD is definitely a huge health problem in terms of his chronicity. So one of the methods that they used in particular this trial called as kidney early evaluation program trial is proteinuria. If you are very known to the family, just like as you were talking about genetics, genetical depiction or even the selection of patients likely to get coronary artery disease, try to start uh, do, doing their uh, 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 what do you call uh, treadmill testing every year, uh, looking at the lipids, look, looking at the other metabolics, etc. And such individuals who are likely to get coronary artery disease. Also, please in your family practice try to see whether you your patients are having proteinuria. It doesn't even cost you more than a treadmill. So yearly or even a six-monthly proteinuria, even for youngsters, you probably are doing a huge, huge service for the mankind because you might probably uh, detect early kidney disease in the patients. The earliest thing to raise is, I mean, earliest thing to come out is albumin, not the creatinine. And of course, a large screening, especially in patients of diabetes, hypertension, and first-degree relatives of those of diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease, probably you can come out with a diagnosis of kidney problems in them by doing a simple testing of proteinuria. In our country, the creatinine is not standardized. I'm sorry to say this, among all the places, even it's PACT, obesity toward the country, there is a variegated number given in the creatinine estimation in the laboratories. They don't really do standardize the uh, laboratories for the creatinine estimation. And this gives a false sense of uh, security for the uh, treating gas uh, general physician that, okay, the creatinine is well within normal limits. I need not worry about the kidney problem. I think that is not so. The vari variations in the kidney est uh, creatinine estimation should be thought of, and you should definitely not give too much credence on only on creatinine estimation. We are talking about aging and frailty, the frailty of adipose tissue, etc. This also, also is going to have some say in, in ki kidney disease also. For example, patient, people who are very frail, 
and who are old, the CKD uh, cannot be, uh, can be missed in them, may not be diagnosed. So KDGO is trying to say whether aging is important factor for uh, diagnosing CKD. So we need to have some correction factors even for uh, Indians, uh, as we had some Indians are known to have more coronary artery disease because of the anatomy. Similarly, there's going to be a change in the creatinine estimation in the Indian's population. And there's one by the CKD EPI equation is going to be a little apt, apt in diagnosing uh, CKD in India, Indian population. And one of the recent study in one of the population of rural areas in Karnataka, they try to estimate the GFR of uh, tribal population and found out that around 60 to 70 mils per minute was an average uh, creatine clearance of this particular group, though they were without any other comorbids. So whether Indians really have a, a low GFR, we really don't know. I think the, there's a lot of studies still going on in the country. One of the method to really uh, probably def, uh, decide about this is a gate method that's been followed in practice, which is little uh, compared with that of radionucleotide uh, GFR estimation has been found to be okay for the uh, estimation of GFR in the Indian, Indian scenario. Similarly, as I said, there's a disparities of uh, EGFR or the creatinine in terms of race, uh, race of the individual. There are some various formulas for this. I don't think we need to really go into the formulas, but I just wanted to highlight this. Many of the laboratories try to give EGFR. This is also one of the fallacies of the problem. You don't need to really jump into the EGFR and try to push into the nephrologist. The EGFR is sometimes may be overestimated. In, as for example, if they're using the MDRD formula, it can go up to by 21%. And that means there is a variance of 21% of really actual GFR that is going on in the patient. Or if it is a CKD EPI that equation, it's going to be 16% variations in the EGFR. So really, you need not into the EGFR. The best in the uh, best in a way is our, our age-old 1968 Cockroft Gold formula, which can be done at the bedside. But a simpler most, I think so, is 100 by creatinine, probably at the bedside. You can say the GFR is almost equal to that particular uh, individual. The caveats are that they don't take into the race into consideration, the weight of the patient, the age of the patient. That's why I'm not so uh, fan of the EGFR estimation. So to do that, whether we can we do any other methods to know whether uh, the GFR is correct? There were some of the methods like 24 hours urinary creatine uh, clearance, which is definitely has got its own problems because of this cumbersome prone for errors, et cetera. And of course, nuclear imaging is going to be a better method for diagnosing the exact GFR. We all know that creatine is an endogenous marker. And to that extent, it can, be a, it can stand the test of time. But the only thing is the lab variance should be thought about. The best, as I said, is DTPA uh, nuclear uh, GFR estimation, which will tell us almost near exactly what is the GFR. Uh, of the particular individual. Based on GFR, we have a classification like G1 to G5, the us uh, telling about the grades of uh, CKD. We are coming back to this particular case. The, the boy felt unwell within a week. He continued to have up and down so-called high, high colored urine, uh, that means hematuring, and also marginally noticed that he had a reduced urinary output. He denied any further fever or any new onset of fever. He denied dysuria or loin pain. And our examination at that point of time was 170 by 95 is blood pressure. Minimal bipedal edema was noticed. He was not pale. He was minimally anectric. He was anectric. He had no rashes. He had no sore throat at that point of time or no clinical, uh, clinically documented arthropathy. His chest was clear and there was no visceromegaly. And the urine was sent for examination, showed multiple, mul too much of RBCs in urine, which are all dysmorphic, and the albumin had gone up to three plus. And there were some WBCs. Albumin, serum albumin had gone down. The urinary protein was remote, estimated on the uh, PCR technique was about 4.5 grams per cent, and his creatinine had mounted from 1.5 to 5 milligram per cent. Hemoglobin was 10.5. Our cholesterol was 280, and the platelets were normal. His AS4 and the C3, uh, C4 complements were normal. He was submitted for a renal biopsy. Renal biopsy is the age old diagnostic technique, and it was the first, was uh, almost in, uh, 100 years ago. It was done in UK, US. And it was by 1951 that this method became much more popular by Iverson and Broom, which they made it much more easier for day-to-day -day practice and for diagnosis exactly what is happening in kidney disease. There are some other caveats, even in, for example, day-to-day -day practice. When you look into the uh, patients with diabetes, with proteinuria, you should look intricately whether it is just a proteinuria because of diabetes or something else. Sometimes, many of them, because not uh, during the duration of diabetes, uh, because of some other reasons, they start getting proteinuria in the urine. So you should really go into the history. For any minimal diabetes to cause nephropathy, it needs 10 years of time. Uh, of course, with other caveats or other, other uh, variables that not not having a uh, good practice of uh, control of diabetes, exercise, etc. 
or if he has concomitant hypertension, there can be a, a onset of nephropathy. But supposing his sugars were well under control for the last 10 years, he's unlikely to get any microangiopathy, I mean, any, unlikely to get even microangiopathy or nephrotic range proteinuria. Other, other way around, if the patient has got a microangiopathy complications like retinopathy with proteinuria, but his diabetes has not been a long VT, you should submit him for a biopsy. Mere presence of microhematuria in the urine is definitely calls for biopsies even in the diabetic patient. So this particular biopsy of this particular child came as IG nephropathy with a crescent, which is a very moribund disease. We have to start him on immunomodulatory therapy. And because of crescents, we need to really give some plasma ferrets, et cetera. We need a transiently, he also needed renal replacement therapy. And of course, with a modified dose of immunomodulatory therapy and use of AC inhibitors, we could pull him out of the dialysis at least. And of course, the rashes that was initially talked in the, uh, which was missed probably with the general practitioners or something else, could have been a possibly a leukocytoplastic vasculitis or HSP. So there are these are the usually innovations uh, comes from stress. Like the world war has been a huge uh, uh, need for uh, innovations in the medical fraternity. Today you are seeing uh, innovations coming in terms of oxygen, oxygen, etc. Because there is a stress in whole medical fraternity due to the pandemic, and people started thinking about something new for each thing. So in this Korean war, they started looking into the various dialysis issues that has been coming in. Uh, oh, all this, of course, in uh, time of stress, probably World War One or World War Two. And this is how today we have a very fancy looking machine. The patient goes for the dialysis and comes out. These are other modes of uh, uh, renal replacement therapy called as peritoneal dialysis, automated peritoneal dialysis and the renal replacement therapy by transplantation, which is the ultimate treatment. And the days to come, there's going to be generative, regenerative therapies, by especially for AKI, stem cell therapies and wearable artificial devices. This is of course, has been conceived over the last 10 years, which is not coming to work. This looks like a RDX bomb, but this can be tied to the belt in the belt and the patient continues to have a dialysis continuously, only need to change this particular cartridge that has been exterior out of the body, maybe now and then. And of course, he doesn't need to visit the hospital. I'm just giving you an overview of what is there in the future uh, for days to come. And this a few of the mix of urinary tract infection. Why this patient was thought to be a, a urinary tract infection by the general practitioners? So you should definitely think about susceptibility, whether the age is one of the factors, the high burden of co-existing illness like diabetes, whether he's uh, got any other disease, sometimes nephrotic itself can call for a uh, onset of an infection because of his uh, low immunity states. Bulimia, as, as, as in CKD, can also cause uh, invitations for urinary tract infection. So the other factors disposing for urinary tract infection should be, you should think of recent antibiotic therapy itself. Sometimes a uh, woman who has been on antibiotic for some other reason presents with the vulvovaginitis and it, has, it can be thought as once again a urinary tract infection because the patient gets a burning maturation, uh, similar symptoms of a urinary tract infection. He, he starts getting prescribed with the antibiotic once again. The same mistake goes on and on. The patient will probably have a fungal infection which has to be treated. And hospital acquired infections are very many. You should definitely look for some treatable factors, whatever be the age. Look for the renal problems, whether there is any pyelonephritis or something else a bladder calculi, or any other obstructive uh, phenomenon in this particular uh, uh, picture of UTI that patient has. Pregnancy is one area which is a little confusing. Patient might have leukocyturia, but the, they may not have a clear-cut picture of even uh, burning maturation or painful maturation. Many of them might have mild, mild, mild signs, but you really need to pick up the urinary tract infection. Women with sexual intercourse with after diaphragm or spermicide are prone for urinary tract infection. Delays post cortical uh, maturation can also cause urinary tract infection. One of the areas where menopausal women will keep having shedding of E. coli in the urine and the back to back they keep getting antibiotics unnecessarily, especially if they are diabetic also. So this should not be, uh, this should not be followed regularly. In the sense, we are unnecessarily exposing them for uh, unnecessary antibiotics. I'll let you know why, this uh, especially uh, postmenopausal women will keep shedding uh, E. coli when you culture them any time of the any time of the year or any time of the day. You see some organism growing in them in the urine. So there are some uh, urinary findings which can mimic urinary tract infection, but they may not be so. The they, the they, this herald that there is some other internal problem that probably giving rise to leukocyturia, so-called puzzles in urine like reflex nephropathy, interstitial nephropathy, analgesic nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, or sickle cell nephropathy, or immuno, immunosuppressed state can cause some of the changes in the urinary, uh, urine, urinary findings. But children of children and adults, you should definitely look for congenital anomalies, a calculi, any obstruction as a heralded vesicoerectal reflex before jumping into treating them 
as a as a giant clinician at the bedside uh, for the uh, for the urinary tract infection, whatever be the age. In elderly, you should definitely look for residual urinary in the bladder. For example, it could be a prostatic problem or it could be a neurogenic bladder. So please look into the residual urine and treat accordingly. This mere giving antibiotics for the urinary tract infection will not be suffice because they come back back and forth, back and forth for the same problem because there is going to be a residual amount of urine in the bladder. This can also be urethral stricture and a prostatic hypertrophy in elderly. Instrumentation, uh, which could not be uh, take, uh, taken by the history, can not be uh, thought by bedside if they are not told the history. So you should definitely go to the history uh, of the patient, why he is getting to urinary tract infection. I have just given highlighted for this particular thing what is called a urethritis. In this era of where there is a lockdown, there is a lot of promiscuity among the youngsters. So especially in the males, they may not have any prostatic problems or anything. These are uh, males, any males are prone for what is called as chlamydial urethritis. So please uh, be in uh, in about uh, this particular knowledge of ure acute urethral syndrome uh, in, uh, in an youngster. Or you, you who otherwise would not be having any urinary tract infection this is basically because of promiscuous behavior. So prostate, of course, can have acute bacterial or chronic bacterial or even sometimes so-called asymptomatic inflammatory prostatitis can give rise to changes in the urine and you keep treating them with antibiotics might lead to problems. In women and UTI, if there is a recurrent systolic reinfection, you need prophylaxis. The definition is more than three urinary tract infections, significant with history of symptoms, you need to treat them with some prophylaxis. Especially postpartum prophylaxis can be considered if the patient is giving a clear cut history. If there is a low dose prophylaxis, is also administered if there is any other problem that has been told by the patient. And of course, self administered therapy should not be recommended unless until advocated. There are some uh, recent studies in 2021. Uh, for the for and against this use of prophylaxis in the urinary tract infection. There are some, of course, uh, uh, against uh, urinary tract infections, treating with antibiotic prophylaxis for a few days uh, can cause increase of risk of hospitalization because other uh, resistant pathogens can, that can be grown because of use of inadvertent use of antibiotics. Uh, so uh, the antibiotic that has been advised is usually a full course antibiotic for 30 days if they have having a recurrent urinary tract infection. What usually in my practice I usually do is if they have a recurrent shedding with symptoms, we give a low dose of antibiotic only at bedtime, especially if it is a male or a female, uh, whatever be the age group. Uh, try to give it for three to six months and then see, you know, take it, taper away the uh, night dose of drug and then you can check the urine for culture. So asymptomatic variety of colonies, colonies, you need not really treat it unless until it is more than two with symptoms in a year. If there's a history of catheter insertion, then you might have to treat the patients uh, if it is symptomatic, otherwise you need not treat. And bacteria with recent catheterization could be re-established uh, with the sterile urine from a suprapubic uh, aspiration rather than trying to uh, collect the cath catheter specimen for culture, which will definitely grow for some organisms due to colonization. So there's a catheter-associated urinary tract infection that has been called as COTI, and we have the catheter association number by divided by number of catheter days into 1,000. This probably might give you an indi indication that probably patient might have a problem of catheter-associated infection. Is it very uh, very scary? Yes, it is very scary. Sometimes a catheter-associated infection can cause severe endophthalmitis that level. From the lower down tract to upper upper part of the body, the patient can have problems like even going into a meningitic state. If the patient has been a long-term catheter without being attended to or without noticing it. But is everybody is at risk of having any infection of urinary tract? No. There are some protective mucopolysaccharide in the layers of the uh, bladder and which will prevent the colonization, especially about TAM hospital sporting, which I was telling the scaffolding from the tubules can probably adhere to the fimbria of the organisms and prevent this colonization. Organisms, I mean, is E. coli, or protease, mirabilis, etc. And the flowing, flowing urine will definitely not cause any problem. It's like a flowing river. It's not supposed to carry any infection or any dirt in it. Only a stagnant water can cause a problem. So you should prevent stasis in the patient inside the bladder, which can attract urinary tract infection. And of course, women, because of the shorter uh, anatomical uh, site at the, to the anal level, can have a, a recurrent urinary tract infection. There has been a lot of uh, debate on the, uh, especially, especially the Western women, the type of uh, cleaning habits they try to do for the perineum, whether they are prone for urinary tract infection. This is debated to the day. This is the, uh, an E. coli or a, uh, the skeptical diagram of the protease mirabilis, where you have a flagella or a fimbri along with the lipopolysaccharide membrane of the e, uh, e. coli or the, or the protease mirabilis, which cling to the uh, uh, wall of the urinary bladder and can cause the problem. 
Suppose Can you summarize, please, the yes, timer? Yes, okay. So there Overshot are some vaccines the time. available. Last vaccines two slides, please. For the, for the prevention of urinary tract infection. Uh, of course, there are various drugs. I just wanted to tell you, highlight about the COVID. Uh, what we are going to face, I, I'm sure you all know about the COVID, how it internalizes into the cells and cause the problem. The problem is the COVID can directly cause injury to the kidney. We are going to have what is called as terminology called as COVID-associated nephritis. That's like a high HIV associated nephritis, which can known to cause vocal segment of glomerular sclerosis. So we should be knowing about the picture of urine, even in the COVID patients to come. They have a similar picture of any other uh, glomerular nephritis because they're going to infect our, all parts of nephrons in the, in the kidney, like tubules, the podocytes, endothelium, and can cause the problems. ACE inhibitors are not a, not a contraindication. You can just go ahead with ACE inhibitors. You must be wondering, I started with a glomerular nephritis uh, patient. I'm talking about urinary tract infection. I just want to depict the common problems that has been seen in the general practice. Common problems are to be thought to be common, but you might uh, have some abnormal uh, patients too. So just to clear this confusion, I just presented this particular case and the uh, presentation for this day. Thank you, one and all. The time for only two questions. Any two questions, then we can move on to the next speakers. We have two more hours of CME left. So presenters, please stick to your time. 20 minutes, please honor 20 minutes. There are other speakers behind you. Uh, the, uh, excuse me. There are cases where uh, the chronic renal failure occurs, renal failure occurs without any cost sometimes, many times yeah. rather. So, yes, this is what is the, uh, this one of 2019 and 2020, uh, what is called a CKDU. They are calling a CKD of unknown origin. The theme of the World Health, World, World uh, Kidney Day was this two years was the same thing. They found out a lot of agrochemicals, a lot of chemicals in the water that they consume has been the cause. They may not be diabetes, they may not be hypertension, they may not be genetic preponderance, but the huge chunk of uh, disease was seen in Andhra Pradesh and Uttagalam and also in some parts of Odisha in our country. And also in Sri Lanka, they had found out that Mexico and other areas, they had a huge chunk of people coming up with kidney disease. And they just covered it up, uh, the media, they didn't want to report it because the whole uh, state or the district will be going to frenzy. So they call it a CKDU to find out the exact cause in them, which is still Thank under uh, research. Thank you.